past three entries. This material was developed in the early phases of our space program, and until it was developed... We're a little more than a minute away from the point in the reentry when communications will be blacked out as the ionized sheath envelops the spacecraft and it's plunged back toward Earth. Until this material was developed, that it is could to not occur proceed with 16 the man's minutes, program. 42 seconds after the hour. This is where the iron nerves of a test pilot are put to the test. You see bits of the ablative shield flecking off there. Uh, there would be a great orange glow outside of the cockpit windows now, according to the testimony of our earlier astronauts. But even as that is going on, and this spectacular picture is developing around him, Shara is slowly uh, controlling the spacecraft, bringing what reading his instruments very carefully, computers, and uh, making uh, the, this roll maneuver, rolling the spacecraft to take advantage of the lift factors. Uh, right now they have entered the point where communications are impossible. They are estimated they will emerge from this blacked out configuration at 21 minutes, 31 seconds after the hour. This magnificent color simulation, we get a very good picture of what's going on up there. And through our uh, Gemini mock-up out at St. Louis, we watch Bob Sharp's hand as he uh, is flicking the controls there in that roll maneuver to take advantage of the lift factor, lift built into this spacecraft. Now they should be getting information at Houston as to how close it looks like Shara is going to be able to bring that spacecraft uh, into the landing area. Shara wants to do a lot better than uh, the previous Geminis, just for his own satisfaction and also to prove that if all your onboard equipment works, this lift factor can be utilized just as they hope. Steady hum on the line here. Elliot C now is putting in a call to Gemini 7 advising him that six is in blackout. Seven says they're just drifting. They're not attempting to control attitudes. They're not going to watch for this re-entry. It was not believed that Gemini Seven could see the re-entry at any case. Uh, at this point, uh, six is, uh, while it might be a might be seen because of the flame of the re-entry. It is still a uh, hundred and, oh, around a hundred and twenty miles below Gemini 7 and some distance behind Gemini 7 now. During this blackout period, the slant range figured by computers is about 115 statute miles between 7 and 6. And it is daylight. Uh, there is no blackness of the sky against which they could see the flames of the re-entry burn. Here are the helicopters from the WASP out over the sea. They've got just uh, nine and a half minutes to splash down. That blackout period should be ending in about uh, uh, two minutes from now, two minutes and 15 seconds to be precise. They are now at about 100,000 feet. They have done most of what they can do to guide their spacecraft at this point. This is Gemini Control Houston. We're about two minutes away from the planned emergence from this blacked out period. We've been having a little conversation with seven getting more information on their thruster problem. We'll be able to recap on that after this re-entry is completed. A minute, 
45 seconds. So they come out of the blackout now. Radar tracks them. Presumably they're in good shape. We have no word until that first voice communication is again a fingers crossed situation. seconds now under the calculated figures for blackout to end. Actually, they're still getting a burn uh, at this moment, although our simulator shows now them the clear. Uh, we're advised has radar contact with the spacecraft. We still not ha have not heard from it. This simulation is not precise at the moment, as I say. They're still getting a burn. They're still in the flame of re-entry and will be until just about Grand this second. Turk has acquisition on six. Elliot C is putting in a call. Stafford comes back with the first call from Elliot C. We yes. read you loud and clear. There they are. They've come through all right now for the deployment of the parachutes, splashdown, and Gemini 6's successful flight is over. They've come back into the atmosphere, they're in the clear, now just for the deployment of the chutes. The drogue chutes should be coming out in uh, just um, one minute from now. The drogue slows down the chute. Uh, Six the is being advised they have radar contact from the WASP. The radar has them in view. The spacecraft is now not in the position you see it here. This shows you the roll maneuver. That's why we wanted to bring this up for you. The roll maneuver that they would be performing to attempt uh, to, to uh, use that lift factor. Actually, the spacecraft is now blunt end forward, falling almost vertically, uh, directly toward Earth, not in the side position as you see it here. Drogue chute deployment uh, should come now in uh, some 23 seconds. Grand Turk Island is communicating with the spacecraft, as you heard Pauline sure, say. The altimeter is off the peg. That means that the altimeter is now working. Uh, they're well. They're coming within the 50,000 foot range. The drogue should go right now. Wait to hear from Grand Turk. That's our simulation in color of what the drogue looks like. There's the drogue. The drogue is out. And Air Boss 1 has just put in a call. Air Boss is an airplane in command of Commander D.A. Barksdale of North Kingston, Rhode Island. He's slightly uprange from the uh, carrier WASP. And now, in one more minute, the main parachute should deploy. At 10,600 feet, the drogue uh, does just what its name implies, slows down the spacecraft so the main, when it blossoms full-blown above the spacecraft, will not be ripped loose. It purely shoots simply to slow down the spacecraft. Elliot C. is asking Six for a readout as to how the reentry went on his needles and eyeball, his uh, eight ball on board. Uh, this but this is the point when communications get a little sticky. Uh, and we'll probably have to wait for that word uh, when they're back down on the water. This is a simulation of the... There's uh, no answer from Six. ...of the main chute deployment, which should come now in another 25 seconds. advises they're tracking the uh, space cap now. They have a plot about something over 30 miles. Thirty miles, that'll be closer than anybody yet has landed. If that Pretty turns out to be it. We should have main shoot. We've had no visual report from the carrier. 
Main shoot should have come 15 seconds ago. 20 now. Main shoot, as you see in the simulator there, has deployed, but we do not have word that that has happened yet. The radar plot from the carrier says it's about 33 miles from the WASP. That shows the spacecraft as, after main chute deployment, it uh, is brought into a horizontal position for landing. The parachute is built with those vents in it, which increase the lift of the parachute. We still have not had word one minute after the main chute was to have deployed that it has deployed. Main chute should have gone out a minute and 15 seconds ago. No word from the wasp that they have sighted the parachute, nor word from the ground. The aircraft uh, designated Air Boss 1 is operating about 15 miles west of the carrier wasp. They've advised they do not yet have six in sight. communication uh, becomes difficult with the spacecraft at this point uh, because it is getting lower of course to the ground and line of sight uh, therefore is not so good to the various tracking stations however that's one of the communications features uh, of the recovery ships the aircraft so they are supposed to be able to get in touch we have had no word that main chute has deployed and the time is now two minutes since that deployment should have taken place. Two minutes and 25 seconds. Two minutes and a half now. In the past, we've had a uh, word directly upon deployment. Uh, it's always the thrilling moment that we know that all is well is when we get that deployment of the main chute. When it's out, then the craft is being slowly lowered to the surface. It's now three minutes since the deployment should have taken place. No word yet. Airbus 1 and Gemini 6 are now in communication. Oh, it's oh, very boy. difficult to understand the conversation here, but we did hear 6 call out there at 3,000 feet just a few seconds ago. 3,000 feet, that's 7,000 feet down from where the deployment took place. The band is struck up, I gather, on the WASP. The WASP advises they're now 2,000 feet. Apparently all is well with Gemini 6. The main chute has deployed, although we never got that word. 1,000 feet. So the splashdown will be right at the precise second, which means the main chute deployed at the precise second. Why we never got the word, we'll never know, but it gave us an awful start here, I'll tell you, while we waited. Splash tank should be coming uh, in uh, just... The WASP now estimates the landing point at 30 miles, 30 miles west of the WASP, back toward Miami. Air Boss, a correction on its earlier position, it is located at about 15 miles west of the point where the spacecraft is landing. That's about 35 statute miles away from the WASP. And that's getting more precise now than we've been so far. Now the WASP is turned in the direction of the landing area. They are moving on it at a rate of 25 knots. the rate of 25 knots. Uh, that's just about an hour's steaming time for the WASP. We show a splash time here on our board at the Mission Control Center at 29 minutes and 9 seconds after the hour. Twenty-nine minutes and nine seconds after the hour. Twenty-nine minutes and twelve seconds. Still no plan. visual contacts, but uh, we are satisfied they're on the water. 
probably never in the history of space flight have we had so little information about the return of a spacecraft from space as today. Where the fault lies, I don't know, but uh, in this moment of great victory for Gemini 6, we can say on the behalf of the American public, we were certainly given a breathtaking moments here with no information about the re-entry. However, now they're back safely on the Atlantic. The WASP is on its way, and presumably those hatches are going to be coming open in just a few minutes. The helicopters, uh, when they get overhead, uh, drop the frogmen uh, who attach a flotation collar around the uh, Gemini 6 spacecraft that will keep it afloat, even if it takes water when the hatch is open. That's to avoid any possible uh, failure at that point uh, that would cause the Gemini to be lost as that second Mercury... The WASP advises the they've accelerated almost. their speed. They're moving at 32 knots, and we're standing by. 32 knots, making pretty good time over toward the, toward the uh, spacecraft. But once that flotation collar is uh, attached, so then the Shira will open up his hatch, and uh, he will be the first to emerge from uh, the spacecraft. Stafford will crawl across the console there between them and uh, emerge from the same hatch. Then they will decide, as they sit atop of their spacecraft, presumably, whether they will stay with it and uh, be lifted aboard the uh, aircraft carrier in the spacecraft, or will they... Uh, Will they leave by helicopter, lift up to the helicopter, and return to the aircraft carrier WASP? That decision is a pilot's decision alone. Uh, in the past, all of the Gemini pilots have chosen to fly by helicopter back to the aircraft carrier deck, but they were a great deal further away, and they would have had to bob around in a very unseaworthy uh, <coughs> spacecraft that... Uh, that's motion without any keel or centerboard or anything to keep it upright is rather sickening, even for the most hardened um, uh, sea-going and space-going man. Uh, however, in this case, Shira being the test pilot he is, and uh, the aircraft carrier being as close as it is, less than an hour's steaming time from the uh, spacecraft, may well decide that he'd like to be the first to ride his spacecraft back aboard the carrier deck. It's pure speculation, of course. We can't dream what is in Wally Shiraz's mind at this moment, except exultation over uh, the success of the rendezvous mission, a perfect textbook flight as far as we know. Everything, every information that's been given us uh, in this 25 hours since uh, that uh, Magnificent liftoff from Cape Kennedy's Pad 19 yesterday morning. We have some uh, film of the uh, kind of maneuvers that are taking place out there now as those flotation collars are being attached, and maybe our boys in the back room who are responsible for all of these magnificent graphics and film presentations that we have been able to show you throughout the flight so can get that racked up, and we can see what's going on out there now. Uh, that is, as it has been done in practice sessions. Yep. As I said, the Gemini 6 is uh, uh, landed, uh, landed between uh, the WASP and uh, Miami, <laughs> although it's a great deal closer, fortunately, to the WASP than it is to Miami. The WASP itself, 760 miles east of uh, the lower coast of Florida, uh, the, this, uh, the uh, Gemini 6, 30 miles, from the WASP. This is Gemini Control Houston. Now we do have a visual contact. Air Boss 1 has a visual contact. He should be approximately over 6. He is in voice communication with the 6 pilots. Successful conclusion of this yep. history-making first rendezvous in space. Dallas Townsend on the USS Wasp. Dallas. Dallas is getting in position there. Uh, told us he thought he'd be ready to go. We're waiting for him to come up.
This is Dallas Townsend aboard the aircraft carrier Wasp, which now is racing at top speed toward the point where Gemini 7 has, Gemini 6 rather, has come down in the Atlantic. A, at a, a distance of about 30 miles, the Wasp is now traveling at 32 knots, which is flank speed, at a direction of 280 degrees on the compass, which is slightly north of northwest. We expect to have the spacecraft within sight of the carrier within a few minutes. It already has been sighted by the Air Boss, the on-scene commander, and by Search 2, the recovery helicopter. Now down to Bernard Eisman on the flight deck. Dallas Air Boss number two uh, reports also that it has the spacecraft in sight. It should be just a matter of very few minutes now before we get word that the swim helicopters are over the site and a decision then will be made as to whether to bring the astronauts out, bring them back by helo, or bring them aboard the WASP in their spacecraft. Bernard Eisman aboard the carrier WASP. That's, that's the next big decision we'll be waiting for and it, uh, as I suggested a moment ago with the WASP, Dallas Townsend says, expecting to have the uh, spacecraft in sight in a few minutes and be able to reach it certainly well within the hour. It would certainly seem likely that uh, Shira and Stafford would stay aboard. Mike Wallace over there at our recovery plot board has a former air boss with him. Mike? Air boss number one, Walter, from the Gemini 5 flight, Gordon Cooper and Pete Conrad, Commander Ken Eklund, Commander Eklund, what's going on right now aboard that Airbus airplane? Well, right now it's probably a lot duller than it was about uh, five minutes ago, uh, Mike. Uh, right now he's attempting, I'm sure, to get the swim helos into position. And uh, photographic helos, he's probably relaying information to WASP, uh, trying to vector them over as quickly as possible. What's his function? What actually does he do? Now, he took off. We saw him take off from the WASP about 50 minutes ahead of time. What takes place then in that 50 minutes until it's flashed down? Well, he's the, the boss of the airborne aircraft in the primary recovery area. He has to uh, control them, as it were, to maintain communications with them, make sure they're all uh, moving in the, in the same direction. Uh, but more Basically, he is the admiral's representative at the datum, uh, on the scene, uh, at the uh, spacecraft area until such time as the admiral gets there himself. I see. Then he isn't, uh, he isn't his own boss. The admiral, White last time, let's say, and uh, William Leonard, Admiral Leonard this time, is the overall boss of this task group. Oh, very definitely. And yes. you report to him. Right. And you are amount to a traffic cop, a communications director, and uh, on-scene commander. Right. Of course, uh, in the event that uh, you're unable to communicate with the Admiral, uh, then you're required then to go ahead and exercise your own best judgment. And in this particular time, you are the boss. But as soon as the Admiral uh, can communicate with you again, he, he takes over where he left off. Thank you very much, Commander Ken Eklund. We now have the uh, actual splashdown point, Walter. This little black wafer beside the wasp. Let's say that the wasp, well, it should be, actually, the wasp should be on the other side of it. It's still steaming toward it. But it is at 23 degrees, 41 minutes north, 68 degrees, 30 minutes west. In the western part, 30 miles off the intended splashdown point, slightly west on its way to Cape Kennedy. It was well within the uh, footprint, uh, wasn't it? Yes. And 30 miles is... Uh 30 miles is still so much closer than the other Geminis. Uh, it's almost, uh, almost uh, half again as close as the best previous one, 56 miles in Gemini 4, McDivitt and White uh, came down that close after White's spacewalk. Gemini 3 was 60 miles off, twice as far as this Gemini 6. And Gemini 5 was a whopping 103 miles, but that's when his computer went out and he couldn't, uh, he couldn't uh, uh, gauge his bank factor. That was Gus Grissom's uh, flight and uh, certainly was not Gus's fault in any sense of the word. It was an equipment failure. Paul Haney has just told, uh, told us through mission control that the parachute is still Tell afloat and the astronauts have said we're in great shape. Wonderful word from Sharon Stafford. We're in great shape. Swimmers are in the water. 
uh, at the spacecraft and are at this moment attaching uh, the flotation collars, as far as we know. We will hear, I'm sure, Paul Haney coming up from time to time on here now with further information from uh, Mission Control in Houston, from which, uh, from which the information aboard the WASP is being relayed. The WASP's uh, air boss sends us information he just heard uh, back to the carrier. Chris Kraft has just advised that apparently our impact prediction that we have been going with earlier was incorrect. We have additional radar data from Grand Turk now being analyzed, which shows the landing took place 12 miles downrange from the WASP instead of 30 to 35 miles uprange, as we earlier reported. This is based on the latest data coming to us via Grand Turk. A 12-mile overshoot is what it looks like right now. Well, that's even better than we had thought. Twice as good as we had thought. 12 miles away. And it again brings up the interesting question about why these impact points are so unpredictable. And even after the landing, they don't seem to know exactly where it is. We've gone through this same exercise every one of these landings. They change it by as much as 40 and 50 miles from, the, from their first uh, predictions. Now, here's Bernard Eisman on the WASP. So the WASP advises the spacecraft is 11 to 12 miles dead ahead, dead ahead of, of our proceeding. We're our steaming south. there now at flank speed, 32 miles, and we see the helos, I understand, hovering over the spacecraft in just seconds. We should be able to see it with the naked eye. Dallas Townsend, up top side, any view yet? Yes, indeed. Up here from the 07 level, we can see the helos hovering over the spacecraft. It's still about 12 miles away, as you say, Bernie, and we'll be there in a few minutes. The spacecraft is on the water. Come aboard the carrier one. To anybody in the military, this will be only too happy to honor. The, uh, there are at least two helicopters. Uh, two, 20 minutes, 20 minutes from now, we should be alongside the spacecraft. Now, we don't know yet whether the uh, astronauts have been elected to remain in the spacecraft or come out of it, but the fact that the WASP will be at the scene in 20 minutes indicates they may very well remain inside the spacecraft. Dallas Townsend aboard the carrier WASP. The astronauts have told us that they're in great shape. Presumably the flotation collar being uh, attached right now and the astronauts will be emerging from their uh, the hatch there. If they choose to open the hatch, uh, which we assume they will, the heat builds up in those uh, spacecraft, uh, 3,000 degrees on the outside, and it's a great tribute to the life uh, support system of the spacecraft that it doesn't get any warmer than a little over 100 degrees inside the spacecraft, and the spacesuits themselves stay below 100 degrees. But uh, once the spacecraft has uh, hit the water, the, the uh, life support system, the air conditioning, uh, does not function that efficiently, and uh, they, the outside heat of the the spacecraft uh, begins to permeate, and it gets pretty darn hot inside, very hot indeed. Haney has just said that the pilots have elected to stay in the spacecraft until they're on board the WASP. They will stay aboard. 20 minutes yet. Fine shape. The pilots in good shape, Shira and Stafford bobbing there in their spacecraft where they're going to stay for 20 minutes. Uh, it's a little less than that now, about uh, 17 minutes until the, until the WASP comes alongside and lifts them aboard. Mike uh, Wallace, uh, could Admiral Don White uh, perhaps, I don't want to put him on the spot, you can uh, tell me if, uh, if, if he doesn't uh, feel free to answer the question, why this, uh, this estimate of where the spacecraft is down uh, on the ocean varies so much. Uh, they've got all this radar equipment, and they say it's down on one spot, and then five minutes later they say, oh no, it's 30 miles over somewhere else, and then another 10 minutes they come in and say, well, uh, we were right the first time, except it's five miles system. another way. Just a moment. We're advised that uh, one of the swimmers has inflated a life raft just off, uh, just uh, very close to the spacecraft, and the other two swimmers, they operate in teams of three, are moving out near the spacecraft to retrieve the R&R the &R section 
the re-entry and rendezvous section which contains uh, electronics and other elements which we're very interested in getting back which will give us a good deal of information on the total re-entry performance of this Gemini 6 spacecraft. This is Houston standing by. And we've lost the picture from the WASP, but we're told that uh, for some reason or other it's uh, out of range of our early bird satellite, which hovers out over the uh, mid-Atlantic. Uh, how it's out of range, I can't imagine. Uh, that can't quite be the explanation, but we're hoping that the WASP picture will be coming up again very shortly. Or at least we can hear from Dallas Townsend on the WASP, and let's do that. Dallas? Flight. The two astronauts report that they're in excellent condition. The uh, swimmers have recovered the R&R &R section, which was jettisoned from the aircraft on the way down. The uh, aircraft, the spacecraft right now is just about 15 minutes from the carrier. The carrier is approaching at 28 knots. The astronauts have elected to remain in the spacecraft, so it will be recovered on board, on board aircraft delegator number three, with the spacecraft, with the astronauts still inside. Now down to Bernard Eisman on the flight deck. Dallas, I'm standing right on number three, and the water is making a white wake as we cut through it very quickly, approaching the spacecraft. As you said, we should be there in just a very few minutes. And Shiraz, as you know, had said before his flight that he elected to stay aboard. That's the way he wanted to be recovered from his Gemini 6 flight. And now that's what he's going to do. Bernard Eisman on the flight deck of the carrier wasp. And now perhaps, uh, Mike, uh, the Admiral can tell us about that uh, impact point. What about it, Admiral? On the uh, first time around, we heard it was 30 miles west, and then we heard it's 12 miles east. Well, you said you didn't want to put me on the spot, but you're really doing it. <laughs> uh, the best thing I remember is that I heard Dallas say at one point that the ship was proceeding at 32 knots on a course of 285. A 285 is 15 degrees north of due west. Therefore, I would tend to believe that if the carrier was proceeding at 30 knots almost due west, that the position west of the carrier was the correct one. I think the only answer to Walter on why there is this confusion in every single case that we've had where the spacecraft was not actually in sight from the carrier is because you get your information from such a great multitude of sources, uh, all of which have some information and none of which uh, is exactly right. The carrier really has the best information once there's been a sighting. And I think if you take it from there, you can't be far wrong. Well, nonetheless, they evidently were steaming west. If they had the best information, they were steaming west, or perhaps they weren't steaming west, but we just thought they were. Well, maybe Dallas had, the, had bad dope, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Walter. When he, when, he, when he heard that Wally Shira had decided to stay aboard the spacecraft, the Admiral, now I'm putting him on the spot again, shook his head and said, oh my, that's, that's a seasick boat. That's a seasick boat. <laughs> uh, well, we've got the picture back from the Wasp, uh, I'm happy to say, uh, Admiral and Mike. Uh, that was a, a scary moment in communications, almost as scary as the lack of communications from the uh, spacecraft itself, which is still unexplained as to why we got no word at all after it uh, began its re-entry. Thank you very much, Admiral White and Mike Wallace, for the explanation of the problems uh, of uh, pinpointing where this spacecraft is. We're, uh, we're going to get that first view of the Gemini 6 as she bobs in the water uh, from our cameras aboard the aircraft carrier WASP. Apparently, for some reason, uh, the parachute uh, did not uh, jettison from the spacecraft as it's supposed to after the landing in the water. The parachute is supposed to cut loose so it will not drag the spacecraft down, uh, but uh, it is still attached to the spacecraft uh, and is afloat. But uh, Paul Haney says from Houston, this should give them no problem. Seas out there today, gentle swells of about three feet was the report about a half an hour ago. We should be hearing from Bernard Eisman on the this WASP Bernard also. Bernard Eisman aboard the carrier WASP. We're fast closing the very few miles remaining between us and the spacecraft just off the bow in the water. There, one of the WASP's helicopters hovering, hovering over the spacecraft. We're in voice communication with astronaut Sharon Stafford and astronaut Shara, in line with earlier expressed wishes, said he's going to come aboard in his spacecraft. 
This will be an onboard recovery in just a very few minutes. They'll be brought aboard with aircraft elevator three. The elevator will be put into a down position. Just as we come up on the windward side of the spacecraft, the carrier acting as a lee to protect the spacecraft in the sea, which is running very easy, just long rolling swells, three to four miles, uh, three to four feet high. The spacecraft's main parachute did not jettison as it's supposed to, and the swimmers in the water report that the parachute was still attached to the spacecraft after it hit. We're coming up on it very quickly now. It'll be just a matter of a few minutes. We are three miles dead off the spacecraft. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a wrong reading. We are eight miles with the spacecraft just off our bow. At this point, we can start to pick up the first smoke flares coming up from the spacecraft in the water. Both spacemen still inside. They report they're in fine condition. Command pilot Shira saying, we're glad to be down. Dallas, how's your view from where you are? Uh, up here on the 07 level, Bernie, we get a marvelous view of, the, uh, of this always stirring and exciting scene. The helicopters overhead, the spacecraft in the water, the smoke marker uh, with the smoke blowing off, and the uh, spacecraft riding gracefully and well on those long, gentle swells of the Atlantic. It's one of those sights that people would go a long way to see, and it's one of the best sights. In fact, it is the best sight that anybody on board the WASP could possibly hope for on this beautiful, warm, late December morning here on the broad Atlantic, several hundred miles southwest of Bermuda and about uh, 700 miles to the uh, southeast of Cape Kennedy. The astronauts report that they are riding well. They have decided to make an onboard recovery. They have decided, and this is the first time that this has happened since the Pacific, when Shira and Cooper decided to remain inside the spacecraft and come aboard without leaving the spacecraft and coming back aboard the helicopter. They will remain in the spacecraft and come aboard the uh, carrier in that manner. If it were a long distance away, the chances are they would have elected to egress from the spacecraft and come back aboard a helicopter because once they're on the surface of the water, the, uh, the uh, cooling system uh, conks out and they uh, become rather warm quite rapidly. But in this case, the carrier should be alongside the spacecraft in a relatively a few minutes and then we will have that onboard recovery on elevator number three. This is Dallas Townsend aboard the carrier WASP. And they're in a beautiful color shot uh, on a long lens camera uh, that uh, the, even the men on the WASP cannot see. We can see more than the men on the WASP can with our uh, color television. We can see the uh, smoke flare which is set out as soon as the spacecraft is on the surface uh, in order for the uh, uh, easy identification, of course, and to mark the spot. We see the helicopters hovering right over the spacecraft. We can't quite see, although it seems to me that I can almost make out a bobbing figure just to the right of that smoke. Uh, perhaps you see it there too. I don't know whether that's the spacecraft or not, but it uh, certainly we're getting in very close with that long lens. The uh, flotation collar being attached right at this moment. Uh, the parachute, uh, which it seems to me we can almost see there on the surface, uh, still attached there. I'm sure that's a spacecraft right over to the right. Right now, almost in the center of the picture, right over the L there on satellite. Now it's bobbing over toward the right, where the E is, as the camera pans just a little bit. You see it right in the center. That's it. That's it. That's the Gemini 6, a first picture, and a communications first. Bernard Eisman on the WASP. Spacecraft being caused by the hovering helicopters, which do several things. They also help flatten out any swells in the sea. And it's just a rewarding sight. Shira knew it. He said in voice communication with the spacecraft, we're glad to be down. And they came down from that history-making rendezvous flight with Gemini 7. The swimmers are in the water. The flotation collar is just about attached to the spacecraft. To it is attached, I'm just informed, to help it ride nice and easy in those easy seas. And other swimmers are just a few yards away, uh, trying to secure the rendezvous and recovery section of the Gemini 6 spacecraft. 
the section that contained the 72-pound radar package that helped Gemini 6 lock on to and come within kissing distance of Gemini 7 up there in orbit. It's a beautiful sight, as I said. The sea's easy, long, rolling swells, and aboard this ship, all in readiness for a welcome aboard to the Gemini 6 astronauts. Dallas Townsend? Yes, up here on the 07 level, we're waiting as you are, Bernie, for this great sight to reach its culmination. In the water, uh, we haven't mentioned their names yet, uh, are the uh, three-man swim team commanded by Ensign Dennis Bowman, who's 25 and comes from Portland, Maine. With him are Jack Kennedy, 22, of Miles City, Montana, and Roger Bates, 19, of Douglaston, New Mexico. Douglaston, New York, rather. Those are the three men who went in on board uh, swim number two. That was uh, helicopter number 57, piloted by Lieutenant Jerry Perrigan. They went into the water and attached the flotation collar around the GT-6 spacecraft. And we on board the WASP here are waiting expectantly for the moment when the spacecraft will come alongside. It will come alongside very slowly and the uh, carrier will be providing pr protection from what wind and waves there are. There aren't much. To, uh, we understand now that the swimmers are talking to the astronauts. They can do this by means of a bright orange plastic uh, material telephone, which uh, they can plug into the spacecraft and by that means plug into the radio circuit and talk directly to the astronauts. In previous flights up until Gemini 5, this was a problem because they had to communicate by means of sign language, and uh, signs are often misinterpreted in moments of stress. This way, the uh, prime swimmer, uh, probably Ensign Bowman, plugged into the, uh, into the spacecraft and was able to talk with the command pilot, Captain Shira. Captain Shira, uh, who flew six orbits before in 1962, coming down in the Pacific, now making his second orbital flight after uh, two major disappointments. The uh, failure of GT-6 in October when the Agena target vehicle uh, went into the Atlantic instead of into orbit, and again just a few days ago when something went wrong at the last instant down at Cape Kennedy and the uh, spacecraft never left the pad at all. Now the whole thing is coming to a triumphant conclusion for Shira and his co-pilot Major Thomas Stafford of the Air Force. They are uh, riding out there, riding easily and well in the spacecraft, waiting for the moment when the carrier will come alongside. The a moment uh, to be remembered, especially for the pilot to swim to that helicopter. He left the flight deck as Lieutenant Jerry Paragon, as you said, but while he was engaged in the recovery operation, orders were received aboard the ship, promoting him to Lieutenant Commander. Uh, nothing, of course, to do with this flight, just routine Navy. And, Bernie, we understand that the captain will make a 270-degree turn so that we can maintain our television link during the approach to the spacecraft. The television link, of course, is something that the carrier and the Navy are intensely interested in. Right now, this is Dallas Townsend aboard the carrier WASP. And we can see something here on our pictures that apparently uh, Dallas uh, even cannot see aboard the WASP. We can see the spacecraft. We're watching it right in the center of our screen as the helicopter hovers overhead on that long, long lens. If Dallas uh, down there on the WASP has a monitor, it may be being uh, blanked out by, uh, by the sunlight, the daylight, so that he can't pick out detail as we can here in the studio. With all of the uh, marvels of communication, we haven't yet figured out a monitor uh, that can be seen in daylight as clearly as it can be seen in a semi-darkened room. Uh, one of the problems all of us reporters have had on the scene of great things, but there is that spacecraft so clearly bobbing in the center of our picture. But now apparently the wasp is, was turning there and, uh, and uh, the cameraman lost the picture for a moment. There it is again. There with the pointer, you can see the uh, spacecraft <laughs> With a long lens like that, of course, even the wind uh, uh, bouncing the lens, uh, well, just that fraction of a fraction of a uh, millimeter of, a, of an inch uh, will cause that much of a, uh, a distortion on the screen, that bouncing around effect. But we'll take that in return for getting this amazing first view of uh, this spacecraft. Swim 2 and the photo helicopter, which is taking pictures to record this scene for posterity and also for the many, many people who will be eager to see the pictures of this, the triumphant end of Gemini 6.
The spacecraft is on the water. The astronauts are remaining in the spacecraft. The flotation collar has been firmly attached by the swim team, headed by Ensign Dennis Bowman. And very soon now, the WASP will be alongside, ready to make the recovery. And it will be an onboard recovery. The spacecraft will be hauled on board aircraft elevator number three after lines have been attached. Aircraft elevator number three is on the starboard side, aft of the uh, carrier superstructure, and that's the, air, the uh, elevator that can be lowered. It's outboard. The uh, lines will be attached by the swimmers in the water, and then the uh, boat and aircraft crane very slowly will haul the spacecraft up onto the elevator. It will be placed on a metal dolly, and then at that point, the hatches will open and the, and the, at, and the astronauts will emerge. Dallas, at that... That smoke, as we said earlier, is from the uh, flares that are set out by the spacecraft itself upon landing to mark its location. And they're not needed. Uh, uh, on this flight, they were close enough in 12 miles from their predicted impact point, and the helicopters were there immediately, saw them with no difficulty. Besides, the parachute remained afloat, and uh, as, soon, as far as we know, it's still afloat, uh, still attached to the Gemini 6. Although the uh, flotation collar has now been attached as well, the uh, swimmers are plugged in, as uh, has been reported, uh, with the spacecraft and in communication, talking to Shira and to Stafford. Uh, They're riding it out, waiting for the WASP to come alongside. I wouldn't want to be held to uh, this fact, but uh, I believe by just some fast calculation, the WASP should be about two miles off. Uh, now, around uh, 3,000 yards. Uh, Mike Wallace has a frogman uh, with him. As a matter of fact, and he can really give us a, a frogman's eye view of what's happening right now. It's our old friend, Lieutenant Junior Grade Marty Every of Notre Dame University, who was with us last time around, Walter. He was the uh, officer in charge of the swim team that recovered for McDivitt and White, as you remember. He has in his hand here that, uh, that orange telephone that they plugged into the to the side of the uh, spacecraft, the Gemini 7, so that indeed they can talk inside, the swimmers can. Marty, the, uh, uh, it seems to be a tremendous amount of smoke if it's just coming from the spacecraft. There's a, the, the, the surface of the water from maybe 100 yards along seems to have smoke over it. Oh, Mr. Wallace, I believe that uh, these flares are thrown out by the search aircraft uh, when they spot this, and it, these flares give the uh, rescue aircraft a, a place to shoot for if they can't actually see the spacecraft uh, that smoke is uh, coming from those flares the uh, green dye is what comes out of the spacecraft itself i see now you people stay when i say you people the the uh, frogmen stay right with the spacecraft under all circumstances even if the astronauts have been taken out and flown by helicopter back aboard the carrier you people stay right with it yes that's correct uh, we close the doors to the thing if they're left open, seal it if possible, and stay with the raft which is attached to the collar. The, on what part of the carrier will the spacecraft be hoisted aboard by this crane? Well, on our shot it was uh, one of the hangar decks. We came right below it. And uh, on this they have a, uh, a rig of pulleys, etc., cetera, to, uh, that hooks especially right onto the rings of this craft. The uh, captain will pull the aircraft carrier right alongside, and uh, we'll hook into this. And when we hook, in, when they hook in, start to haul in, is when we leave the leave the raft. I understand that Dennis Bowman, who is the lead swimmer on this uh, M1 team, has another reason to be particularly happy this week. Not just the recovery of Gemini Six, but something else. Yes, that's true. Uh, his wife just last week gave uh, birth to a nine-pound, nine-ounce uh, little boy which uh, he has yet to see, so I imagine he'll be... Wasn't that supposed to happen to one of the astronauts too, Walter? Yeah, Jim uh, Lovell, uh, his wife, is expecting any moment now, uh, thought that the birth might come even as Lovell is circling uh, the Earth, and it might still. He's due for another 48 hours up there, and anything could happen. Uh, well, that would be a Gemini operation then. There are going to be a lot of reasons for cigars to break out around Houston and at uh, Navy centers. Uh, everywhere. Also, uh, besides the boys of getting promotions out there among that uh, frog team, uh, of course, the astronauts get promotions, uh, automatic promotions. Stafford uh, 
went up as an Air Force Major. He comes back as a Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, Shira does not get promoted. Uh, he has gone as high as uh, you can go in that automatic promotion system of space flights to Navy Captain, uh, equivalent to uh, Army or Air Force Colonel, and uh, he stays at uh, that rate now. And Marty Look how Avery. close uh, we can see this, Mike. Isn't this a fantastic view we're getting from the uh, from the television cameras aboard the Wasp, being relayed to us by the early bird satellite on that long lens? We're being able to pick out the tail now of the uh, Gemini Six. We'll explain again if anybody's missed it that this uh, smoke you see is from the flares, uh, as Senator Everly points out, dropped by the spacecraft. Uh, I mean, dropped by the recovery. Uh, uh, airplanes not and the helicopters not the spacecraft itself the spacecraft carries flares in case it is out of touch and needs to identify its location and everly corrects me on that to these flares he believes dropped by the helicopters it seems highly likely uh, there's the picture now and not on the long lens uh, and even that uh, we're getting now a good clear picture the wasp must be indeed closing there's the long lens picture again uh, Shira and Stafford are buttoned up inside the spacecraft. They have not opened the hatches. Uh, the procedure when being lifted aboard is to not open the hatches, to stay buttoned up. It's like they're standing up. It's probably very warm inside the uh, spacecraft uh, right now, something over 100 degrees and not particularly comfortable. Although there is very little wave activity, it doesn't take very much for that spacecraft to do a lot of bobbing around. It's not a very seaworthy device. It floats, and that's about all. Lieutenant Every says, Walter, that it looks as though a couple of the swimmers are standing on the flotation collar, staying right with the spacecraft at this moment. I, uh, that, uh, yeah, that's good identification. I suppose that's what it is. I didn't know what those little nodes were out there. Those are some, those are two of the swimmers, I guess. Wasp uh, closing the last we heard at now around 25 knots. She got up to flank speed. That is her highest speed of 32 knots a short while ago. And this picture uh, is being enlarged for you exclusively on CBS. So this uh, tight shot we see here now. It's uh, we can show you what the a pool picture, all of the television uh, cameras are getting. Uh, this is the picture. We take that small portion and by our special CBS process can enlarge it for you like that. That's what, that's the equivalent of our long lens. Thus spake Zarathustra. Recovery should be coming now, and uh, it's estimated about five minutes uh, when the WASP gets up there a little bit uh, closer. Uh, the actual recovery operation gets underway aboard the WASP itself. As we have said, Shira and Stafford, after that highly successful flight, uh, will ride their spacecraft back aboard the WASP. The first time this has been done in the Gemini program, Shira did it in Mercury, and so did Cooper in Mercury. The pickup should begin now, I'm told, not five, but 15 or 20 minutes. Apparently, the uh, WASP has slowed down a little bit. Uh, it's going to, it's still now two and a half miles away, the latest reading from Paul Haney at Mission Control. Lieutenant Avery has a thought about what may be going on out there, uh, Walter. Right. Well, the uh, way it looks now, the, when the spacecraft comes down, they can't open these doors, even if they elect to uh, remain in the craft and a uh, flexible shield is pulled up over this uh, door but still allows ventilation. So uh, why they may be on the craft now is they'll probably reclose these doors if this has happened when they are lifted aboard. In other words, they let a little fresh sea air into the uh, spacecraft and then just before they pull it aboard, they reclose the hatches. For safety purposes, yes, sir. This is a very calm sea, or a comparatively calm sea, so it's probably not quite the seasick machine that it's been suggested that perhaps it can be on occasion. Yes, they, they said uh, three-foot swells, I believe, which is ideal conditions to put this uh, flotation collar on. It gives you enough to 
capsule is bouncing around a little bit. So. You know, I think Mike of Shira the was said I, I wouldn't swear. How long, Lieutenant Avery, have the men aboard the Wasp been embarked on this particular cruise? It's how long since they've seen land? Well, they left uh, approximately uh, six days before the last off. So they've been out there. Uh, so be about close to 20 days when the next one is recovered, and another four or five days to get back in to for the carrier. So it's a it's a pretty good cruise they're making out there now. But everybody will be home for Christmas, hopefully. I hope so. It's another textbook flight for this 42-year-old New Jersey native. Oradell, New Jersey was his hometown. Wally Shira, his Gemini, his Mercury flight, Sigma 7, was absolutely perfect right on the mark on every part of it and he landed four and a half miles from the kearsarge out in the pacific and now his gemini six flight it lifted off perfectly after those two great disappointments back october 25th and today uh, and uh, and the the flight uh, then that was scrubbed on the pad after ignition of the engines dallas townsend advises us from the wasp that one of the hatches does seem to be open it would be the hatch over Shira. As uh, Lieutenant Everly told us, uh, that may be what indeed is going on, reclosing the hatch before being lifted aboard. It's only uh, the only the uh, command pilot's hatch that is open. The, it's the one that is right on top as the spacecraft bobs there. Let's recount very quickly for anybody who came in late, and if you did, I pity you because this has been an exciting morning. Uh, the recovery of uh, Gemini 6 is now taking place some 750 miles east of uh, the lower coast of Florida, east of Miami, roughly. The aircraft carrier Wasp, with our television cameras relaying a picture through early bird to us, is uh, Getting the, is closing in on the spacecraft, which we see in our screen. The helicopters have been overhead since splashdown, uh, oh, almost 45 minutes ago. The flotation collar has been attached. We can see the frogmen uh, perched on the edge of the spacecraft on the flotation collar. We've been told that the hatch over Shira is uh, open, or has been at any rate, uh, then the Retrofire and return as the entire flight of Gemini 6 has been perfect. We expect to have the pilots back aboard the aircraft carrier WASP in about another uh, 10 minutes. Let's go now to Dallas Townsend aboard the WASP. WASP. And by Captain Joseph Berryman, who is Chief of Staff to Admiral Leonard. Then after uh, very few greetings, uh, these uh, ceremonies don't take long, they'll be taken down below to sick bay where they will undergo medical examinations. In the case of Shira and Stafford, the medical examination will be much more cursory than it has been in previous uh, physical medical examinations of this type. The reason being that the assumption is that uh, both of them are in good condition and all they'll do is check their heart, pulse rate, eyes, ears, uh, nose and throat, and all those other uh, ingredients that go to make up a physical examination. The uh, examination of uh, the GT-7 astronauts will be far more detailed and complex because after all they will have been up there two weeks by the time they come down tell us that uh, flight of gt7 is primarily as you know a medical flight uh, designed to determine uh, how much man can take in space in cramped position and in a weightless state whereas of course gt6 would be the rendezvous flight and uh, the astronauts uh, being uh, made ready to come aboard this carrier will be checked to see of course that uh, they came through their uh, flight in in relatively good condition we have word of course that the hatch, as you said, is open, but that it will be closed prior to uh, uh, the carriers coming alongside. The hatch open, no doubt, to let some of this very fresh southwest Atlantic air into that spacecraft. Uh, its air conditioning system, its cooling system, not operating once it's in the water. Yes, we have heard also that uh, SWIM-2, uh, the recovery helicopter, is bringing the doctor back aboard. That was Dr. Carpentier. Uh, 
Dr. Carpentier, who was uh, the assistant to, to uh, Dr. Howard Minners, the NASA recovery physician, flew out there in order to uh, render any assistance that might be needed, any uh, initial assistance, but he was not needed, so Dr. Carpentier is coming back on board the carrier. They will be greeted, of course, by Dr. Carpentier and also by Dr. Minners and a large array of uh, outstanding other medical talent, both civilian and military. Some of the uh, most highly qualified specialists in the Navy, in the Air Force, and in private life are out here on board the carrier ready to examine the astronauts and make sure that they are in tip-top shape, which everything indicates that they are indeed. Dallas, one of the tests that the Gemini 7 astronauts will be subjected to, but not the Gemini 6 astronauts, will be a, a stamina test. Each one uh, will be put on a piece of equipment that is something brand new to post-flight examination. It looks something like an exercycle on which the tension can be increased and therefore make the astronaut uh, exert a greater degree of energy. The space medicine people want to find out just what kind of shape uh, astronauts who have been in lengthy flight exercise cycle on which the tension can be increased and therefore make the astronaut uh, exert a greater degree of energy. The space medicine people want to find out just what kind of shape uh, astronauts who have been in lengthy flight are in when they conclude that flight uh, in case they have to do some work. Uh, we just have word from Flag Plot, and of course we both can see it. The spacecraft is 3,000 yards away from the carrier. We're turning a tight circle to bring it alongside our number three elevator. And the elevator crew, of course, is ready, waiting orders to drop the elevator to the hangar deck position from whence the recovery operation can begin. The aircraft still circling over that spot. Now there are only two helicopters uh, staying with the spacecraft. And one of the air bosses, we can't tell yet from this distance whether it's number one or two. But it's a bright, beautiful day. The spacecraft coming down so close to the bow of the USS Wasp uh, made it possible for astronaut Sharon Stafford to stay in the spacecraft. That's the way Shara wanted it. That's the way he wanted to come aboard. And, of course, that is the ideal way of recovery. There isn't any chance of risk to the astronauts being hauled aboard a helicopter hovering above. And, of course, there isn't any risk uh, to swamping the spacecraft uh, if the astronauts stay with it uh, while they're closed. There wasn't much risk of swamping today anyway. The Atlantic is bright and blue and few broken clouds overhead. The Gemini 6 spacecraft on its return from its historic rendezvous mission, riding easily in the sea that's running at no more than three to four feet of long running swells. Yes, Bernie, up here on the 07 level, we're out here at the very most forward part of it, and the uh, carrier is now turning. It's, it's turning to starboard, and the uh, spacecraft is in the water about 2,500 yards away. The carrier is now preparing to make its final approach. Still overhead are uh, Air Boss and Air Boss 2, and there are three helicopters. Number 57, with Dr. Carpentier aboard, has uh, been detached from the immediate scene and is flying around the spacecraft, around the uh, aircraft carrier, and the chances are it may be landing fairly soon. That's the one with uh, Dr. Carpentier, who might have jumped if he'd been needed to the water, but wasn't needed, so he didn't do it. He didn't have to get wet. Sometimes the doctors do, but... All in all, the, uh, the record of recovery of astronauts has been exceptionally, in fact, brilliantly good. They have uh, never needed any kind of immediate medical assistance once they're on the surface in the spacecraft. For WASP, Dallas, uh, this is uh, part of a record. Uh, it is the second space flight that she recovered in the Gemini series. The first one, the Gemini 4. And now, we, as we are coming up alongside the ship slowing in the water, uh, the number three elevator has gone into the down position and the handling crew for the lines and the boat and aircraft crane uh, have come out from the hangar deck and they are manning the number three elevator in the down position. The spacecraft is now directly ahead of us and we're heading st straight, straight ahead at no more than, well, I'd say 10 knots, right toward the spacecraft. What we see there, gentlemen, is the cradle that will take the uh, spacecraft when it comes back aboard. By the way, are open now, and one of the astronauts has his head sticking out. We don't know which one it is, but it could well be uh, 
Captain Shira, who was the command pilot. They motioned, of course, Dallas, uh, to the uh, swimmers, informed the swimmers, who then informed the helicopter that they would close the hatches as the ship came alongside. Yes, that's right. That's uh, to avoid any possibility of the spacecraft shipping water in those moments, those rather ticklish moments when they're attaching the lines uh, off the starboard side of the carrier. That giant boat and aircraft crane is being made ready. It's big hook uh, rising high top towards the top of the block and uh, the light line hanging down from it, the line that will be fired over to the swimmers who will attach it. On that elevator, the Marines are standing ready along with sailors in tropical short sleeve white prepared to offer a guard of honor to the spacecraft as they come aboard. Some Marines in white hats uh, uh, nailing down a, a little sign that says, Welcome aboard, Wasp. And uh, the Gemini seat, the Gemini trailer is out in its position almost to the forward lip of the number three elevator and Chick Stuka, the McDonnell Aircraft Corporation man, uh, is there ready to bring his baby aboard. One of the first jobs he has, as you know, as soon as the astronauts get out, is to safe the spacecraft to make sure that some of the Ohm's fuel still left aboard is not inadvertently triggered. It's uh, highly poisonous and could be quite dangerous. Right up at the uh, bow of the uh, carrier, a considerable group of sailors and their tropical whites is gathered together with some of the flight deck personnel and the uh, gun bays on the starboard side are crowded with sailors also in tropical white watching as the carrier makes right now what seems to be a fairly rapid approach it's still uh, one that involves a lot of uh, tricky sailing and seamanship on the part of captain hartley who is an expert at this sort of thing back to bernie eisman dallas it was making speed, the Wasp was, just a few minutes ago, but now it's slowing down very perceptibly. The yellow rafts of the swimmers easily visible just off the bow. Uh, the helicopters, three of them still hovering there, and the two twin-engine aircraft still flying their concentric circles at very low altitudes. Now the bow of the Wasp is drawing almost even with the spacecraft in the water. It's smoke flares, uh, the uh, smoke flares uh, that help identify it from the air, almost out of fuel, they're dying out. And up ahead you can see the green dye in the marker, and number 57 helicopter, the one that spotted it, uh, the first helicopter piloted by now Lieutenant Commander Jerry Perrigan, the helicopter that dropped its swim team into the water to attach the flotation collar. Uh, the swim team, led by Ensign Dennis Bowman, and the swim team still in the water, has come aboard, has been recovered by the carrier. Uh, that leaves now three helos uh, flying in position, the Wasp coming very perceptibly to a slower speed, as the spacecraft and the two rafts with the swimmers are right on our bow. We're right on our bow. We can get a very good view of them now. Two rafts in the water. Uh, one swim team, of course, in the water to secure the radar and recovery section of the Gemini 6 spacecraft. And that they did. And now up ahead, we can see that the astronaut, Sharon Stafford, are securing the hatches on their Gemini 6 spacecraft. They had opened them uh, sometime after landing in the water to let in some cool air, some of this cool Atlantic sea breeze on this beautiful day in the southwest Atlantic. The seas were so easy that there was very little chance of the Gemini 6 spacecraft swamping with its hatches open while it was away from the ship. But now as the ship draws alongside, to bring it aboard by crane, the ideal way for recovery of the Gemini 6 spacecraft, with, of course, the astronauts inside. The hatches are being closed. That's so the ship, which is coming up to windward of the spacecraft, to offer it some lee in case uh, there is a bit of wind and to help some of the running seas stay off it, uh, should turn up some turbulence that could uh, uh, jostle it about in the water more than is absolutely necessary. Now we've got a beautiful so view of the uh, heat damage to that uh, heat shield, the ablative shield at the bottom of the spacecraft now as uh, we come alongside. Marking the place of Gemini 6 in the water as it rides almost like a victorious gladiator on its flotation collar, the heat shield facing this way, 
uh, swimmer is standing on the flotation collar. There are rafts afloat and tied to it, uh, helping to guide uh, the carrier alongside. We're coming to almost dead in the water now as the Wasp's captain, Captain Gordon Hartley, executes this extremely delicate maneuver. This monstrous ship coming alongside that tiny, tiny little spacecraft riding in the water and must come alongside without a bump or a wave. And yet it's got to come alongside so close that a line can easily be fired from the number three flight elevator that's in its down position. I'd and like to see some of those alongside. Sunday motorboat jockeys that come alongside the spacecraft out there. Railed out, rolled out. A red carpet that has seen duty aboard the Wasp before. It was the carpet uh, that uh, Gemini 4 astronauts McDivitt and White walked upon when they were recovered by this ship earlier this year. And that carpet, incidentally, on its reverse side has the maker's slogan, which is heavenly carpets. Uh, something of an apt description for the service this red flock carpet has seen. The microphones are set up. The rope handlers are ready, the marine guard is there, the sailors forming ranks of side boys on both sides, reporters and photography is expectant, and now the wasp is coming up even closer on Gemini 6, and we see the second raft, uh, the swimmer's raft, uh, with the R&R section attached to it. That R&R section weighs about 300 pounds, it's 42 feet long, uh, 42 inches long, rather, and it's a section that is jettisoned from the Gemini spacecraft when the main chute is deployed at just less than 10,000 feet. And it's that section that contains the rendezvous radar equipment, the equipment that allowed Gemini 6 to come within, as I said before, kissing distance of Gemini 7 up there in orbit. And right now, the Gemini 6 spacecraft on its flotation collar orange swimmer's raft tied to it. Uh, two swimmers standing on the flotation collar, one in the water in case the lifeline from the wasp should go astray. The green dye marker is still trailing it beautifully and brilliantly in the water. And she's coming up, we're almost midships. We're in the very last few seconds of this extremely tricky business of spacecraft recovery at sea. Two other swimmers just about 20 feet away from the Gemini spacecraft sitting on its collar with another rubber raft and attached to that the R&R section that was particularly wanted by NASA on this flight. That's one thing they really did want to recover. You see the, the frogman just a moment ago using that orange telephone, and Lieutenant Eberly, there he is. Uh, he's talking to uh, the uh, pilots in the, in the spacecraft, and they're looking in the window at the on that side of the spacecraft, they'd be looking in at Stafford. We're, uh, we're coming up very slowly now on the spacecraft. Uh, the markers, uh, the smoke markers, are off several hundred yards off the starboard side. And it's a colorful scene now. The bright yellow flotation collar attached around the spacecraft with the swimmers standing on the collar alongside it, the orange wife raft. Trailing off from the uh, narrow end of the spacecraft is the green fluorescent dye marker. And just a few yards away is the flotation collar, uh, 42 inches long, weighing 300 pounds, which was recovered from GT6 just as it was in GT2. The reason it was recovered, not only that the uh, swimmers jumped to it in a hurry, but also because this one has a flotation device in it. They are very anxious to uh, look at this R and R section because it contains the rendezvous radar. This uh, this man is firing a uh, uh, gun that fires a line across uh, to the spacecraft. I assume that that's that that's the gun. Yes, he just fired it. Perhaps in the background you heard uh, an explosion. That was the line gun firing the line out to the spacecraft. It fired directly over with a beautiful shot. They have the line aboard. Three swimmers are hauling the line in. He's got a thin Three, line, uh, hardly bigger than a string, uh, which it then pulls over the heavier line. Drawn alongside the carrier. The carrier is now dead in the water. Just about dead. It's probably moving at uh, just a couple of knots. You see a moment ago, pull the heavy line in. That's Jack Kennedy. There he is. There's the heavy line. Recognize him correctly. He's 
standing there with his uh, with his uh, swim gear on, hauling the heavier line out. He's leaning against the spacecraft. Now another one of them is, um, is up standing alongside him as the third swimmer in the water. And a few yards away is the uh, other life rat with three swimmers on that. They're the ones who jumped and recovered the R&R &R section. That's riding easily on the water with the aid of its flotation device. They snapped now, the line onto the strap. In. Still got one standing on the... Uh, on the uh, flotation collar, and the uh, spacecraft is now just about 20 yards from the aircraft elevator. A group of NASA officials, representative of McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, waiting to receive it. The Bowdoin aircraft crane is in the out position, and it's being hauled steadily now, right up under the lip of the number three elevator. That Bolton aircraft crane, by the way, is operated by Bolton's mate, Odie Miller, who comes from Monroe, Louisiana. He's the man who will perform the last ticklish operation of GT-6, making sure that the B&A crane comes down correctly and that the uh, spacecraft is hauled on board without any damage to its sensitive equipment. The spacecraft is now underneath the uh, flight deck lift there, and we cannot uh, see the actual operation uh, with our television cameras. We'll pick up the picture again, uh, the live picture of the lift aboard as the uh, crane brings the spacecraft up level with the deck. And now the uh, Navy is getting ready for the reception of astronaut Sharon Stafford. Just in board of number three elevator. It's a crowded scene, a colorful scene. That's uh, Mission Control uh, and Houston looking at uh, this scene being brought to them by uh, by the uh, television networks. Perhaps you can hear the band. Red carpet has been laid out along one side of it, a line of flags. One of the flags being that of the box. And on the box of the flag is GT. Spacecraft which they recovered in June. The Army, the Navy flag, Coast Guard, and the Marines. A line of Marines and alongside the red carpet, which stretches from here almost to the hatch leading down to sick bay. That's where the astronauts will undergo their medical examination. And those banners, which those banners which were attached to the superstructure of the wasp have now been taken down and reattached here inside the uh, hangar. Bay, number three hangar, bay on the carrier wasp. And three, USS Wasp, Shiraz, with the American flag. Spirit of 76, season's greetings from the wasp. And another banner, Gemini 6, showing the spacecraft with a bolt of lightning in the background. Off, a few yards to starboard, a whale boat with a group of Navy men in it, all wearing uh, life jackets as is customary and required. And we surmise that there's at least one man out there with a rifle to make sure that no wandering sharks intrude into this merry scene. And still farther away, the destroyer Walter, our plane guard destroyer, destroyer which has been accompanying the Wasp ever since we left Boston over two weeks ago. And between us and the Waldron, a helicopter hovering overhead, creating great turbulence on the water below. A bright, a merry, a colorful, and a cheery scene here on the Wasp. It's just about 12.35 p.m. Wasp time, 11.35 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The spacecraft has been hauled on board. It's up over the lip of the number three elevator. Very slowly now, it's being lifted up still farther, and it's being brought over the dolly. The spacecraft is seared and blackened, as you can imagine, from its trip down through the atmosphere. This is a familiar sight to all of us who have seen these spacecraft after their space trips. Obviously going through tremendous heat on the way back, but Clearly visible is the flag of the United States and the legend United States on one side. On top are the two hatches. One of them is open. 
Just a trifle. Now it's being lowered onto the dolly very carefully. Narrow end in. Both, hatch, both hatches are open just slightly. A short flight of wooden steps will be brought out to either side. Here they come. The steps painted bright yellow. On one side, the emblem Task Group Bravo with the boss. There goes Chick Stuka of McDonnell Aircraft. He's raising the hatch over the command pilot. <laughs> Captain Shira has his hand up, shaking hands with Chick Stuka, with Howard Minners, the recovery physician. In back of Howard Minners is Dr. Don Stolkin. The and there's Tom the Stafford. On the other side, Dr. Bill Carpentier, Dr. Minner's assistant, and then Ben James, the NASA Public Affairs Officer. We see now. We got a picture of Wally Shira a moment ago on his side, and now Tom Stafford on his side. Captain Walter Shira of the United States Navy, the command pilot of GT-6, back on board the carrier after their triumphant journey through space and their rendezvous with GT-7. And a bright, warm sun beams down on this gay and colorful scene here aboard the... And what they're doing now is disconnecting their uh, various sensors and various equipment so that they can climb out. Tom Stafford is the first one we see out. Incidentally, the last uh, function aboard the spacecraft uh, before the potation collar is attached to the turn off the electric power, and that's what they were doing, or actually before they come off. Preceded by Don Stolten and Howard Minners. And looking a little bit worn, needing a shave, they shake hands, they smile, they greet each other. Happy, reveling in their great... And there is Captain Gordon Hartley, commanding officer of the boss. Rear Admiral William Leonard. Vice Admiral Charles Bickley, commander of anti-submarine forces in the Atlantic. Without saying anything, there's Joe Siegel of NASA, one of the technical de debriefers. They're walking slowly along the red carpet, walking toward the sick bay, right along the red carpet, past this row of flags, heading towards sick bay, preceded by Don Stokin, Captain Shira, Major Stoffer, then Ben James, walking slowly down into sick bay for the medical examination. A little crush down there, a little crush in the ladder going down to sick bay, just one level down. Captain Hartley, Admiral Leonard, officers, they're leaving the hangar bay number three right now. The band playing bravely in the background, and this group of two astronauts and a large number of doctors and other officials heading down into sick bay to begin their medical debriefing which probably will only confirm what a visual analysis has already made perfectly clear. The astronauts are in excellent shape. Captain Shira looking rather sunburned, not from uh, his space flight, but probably from uh, being out in the sun a little bit earlier. Captain Shira looking sunburned, extremely happy. Major Stafford equally happy, not quite a sunburn. Wally Shira is a great water skier. He probably got that uh, waiting for his flight. It was a long time coming, and it happened very fast when it did come. The spacecraft and the astronauts back on board the carrier. Back on board the carrier, and the whole thing is over. GT-6 has come to a very triumphant and brilliant club. Oh boy, thank you very much to Alice Townsend aboard the Wasp. What a great, great picture. What an exciting thing that it was, wasn't it, to watch these men actually 
come out of their spacecraft aboard the WASP. The picture transmitted to us uh, for the first time of such a scene, alive, uh, relayed by early bird satellite and uh, back to our home screens. A great sight as Wally Shira, that 42-year-old Navy captain, and Tom Stafford, the 35-year-old Air Force major, but now to be a lieutenant colonel, automatically promoted because of this most successful uh, flight, uh, he, uh, uh, they are back safely aboard the WASP. And we cannot possibly express for all of you in this audience who are as excited as we were about seeing these pictures enough thanks to the United States Navy for helping us get the equipment aboard the WASP and permitting us to do it so that you could see that great picture. Uh, it took us a while to uh, get it set up. It's the first time we've been able to do it now with this flight of uh, the Gemini 6, but that uh, same equipment will be there on Saturday morning so that we can see, hopefully, Borman and Lovell when they return from the flight of Gemini 7, which is now winging around the Earth in its 179th orbit and is out uh, beyond Hawaii on the way toward another pass over the United States. And they'll be getting the word that uh, their space mates, uh, Shira and uh, Stafford, are safely back aboard the WASP in excellent shape. They came aboard the WASP exactly one hour and five minutes after their splashdown in the Atlantic. They came closer to their uh, target point than any Gemini heretofore, only 12 miles away. Uh, and that's uh, about a, uh, oh, uh, three times closer. More than that, it's almost five times closer than uh, the nearest uh, landing before that. Uh, it uh, is another part of the perfect record of Gemini 6, which established rendezvous in space with Gemini 7 yesterday, the first time that's ever been done, put us in the lead of the Russians in the space race, yep. undoubtedly for the first time, and also put the entire uh, world a little bit closer to true exploration in space. CBS News color coverage of Gemini 6 and 7 will continue in a moment after a pause for station identification. This is CBS. Project Gemini, two weeks in space. Today the recovery of Gemini 6 astronauts Shira and Stafford. And now again from the CBS News Space Center in New York, Walter Cronkite. And we've just seen uh, that almost unbelievable sight. We went through the entire Mercury program and these earlier Gemini programs uh, seeing the recovery of the astronauts aboard the recovery vessel uh, by film flown to us uh, with great speed, uh, but not uh, anything quite as thrilling as that being able to see it at the moment that the hatch is open. Actually, we wouldn't have been uh, had quite such a thrill even with the earlier three Gemini flights because uh, those men left their uh, capsule at sea and came back uh, by the recovery helicopters, it would have...